Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar entitled uh, Simple Steps for Effective Use of Video Within Your LMS. Um, my name is Rob Thomas, I'm the Technical Director at a company called Streaming Limited. We're a partner to uh, Real Networks in the, in the US. Um, just as a quick, uh, some quick program notes before I begin my presentation, if there's any questions as we go along the presentation, you can feel free to put those into the, uh, the chat window and we'll respond to those throughout the presentation and also we'll have time to do a, a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. If you need any uh, further information on what we're doing today, uh, we're going to make the recording of this webinar available and we'll also have some web links at the end of the presentation that you can go to if you need any further information on what we've shown. So as a quick introduction to this subject, um, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to go through some some industry trends and some stats that are of interest to, to the people on the uh, webinar today. I'm also going to go through how people currently handle uh, video and audio within their LMS and talk through the kind of the pros and cons of, of those particular methods. Then I'm going to go through just from my own personal experience um, the sort of things that you should consider when setting up a video system within your organization, particularly one that will work with your um, learning management system. We're then going to go through how, how you can make the easy, uh, media easy to publish and make it accessible to people and how you can make uh, a kind of uh, sort of an internal YouTube type experience very simple and easy to configure and customize and make it something that people will use within your organization. And then we're going to go through how you secure the content within such a system and how you make the content uh, available to those that, that have it and, and to those that, that don't um, protect it. Then I'm going to show some, some demos of some customers that, that already do this type of thing. And uh, if we get time, I'm going to show some demonstrations specifically of integration with uh, LMS systems. So as, a, as an intro into this, um, these are some uh, statistics that I saw recently uh, actually published by uh, Blackboard. So um, these really, to, to me, got across the point that uh, the use of technology within education is something that is absolutely essential and is, is growing uh, exponentially, as is the use of video. The first stat I found particularly uh, um, striking is that you know, most of these people, this kind of demographic that, that go to university, uh, their phone or their tablet or whatever they're using as an electronic device is something that is so essential to them they would rather give up their sense of smell than, than, than give up that particular device. The other thing to be, be aware of here, and I'm, I'm sure this is something that most people on this webinar are aware of, is that most of this stuff in terms of education and courses and things like that are, is going online, and the enrollment rates for, for online courses are, are up much more than they are for, for courses that would be done in a physical setting. So with those statistics in mind and, and the use of video um, growing in, in that way, there's these kind of key drivers that are, that are out there in terms of having your, your own media library. The first one's pretty obvious. Things like YouTube are, are out there, Vimeo, etc. And those things have made it much more easy for people to publish and share content. So people are, are very comfortable with those particular systems. It's also easier to create content. Things like the flip camera, for example, has been something that you, know, you can just plug it into your computer via your USB. There's no need to kind of convert something from physical media to digital media. There's also um, media streaming uh, per se has been, uh, become much more mainstream. In the US, you have uh, Hulu. In the UK, we have the BBC iPlayer. So people from lots of different demographics are now watching video online as were, whereas they weren't before. The other thing that I find from, um, from a kind of LMS perspective or VLE perspective is that there is this increased desire amongst learning technologists to, to use video in those contexts. So there's a driver from internally from within these organizations as well and to get the kind of a, the SAN used as well. There's also other things that, that tie into devices, tablets and mobiles, things like that. iTunes U, the kind of the, the, the cream of the uh, higher education content, that's on iTunes now. So that's made it uh, so that video is much more demanded within that uh, context. And then obviously, you know, everyone has a, a smartphone these days. So that, that's another thing that people have to bear in mind. And particularly with uh, students being a lot more demanding now with the university costs going up. They, they want these things to be accessible. 
a lot of the people that are going to university are of the YouTube generation that you know have grown up with these things, so it's, it's something that they expect. So briefly, before I move on to talking about uh, kind of existing publishing models, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a poll um, just out of interest from, from the people that are on the call. If you can kind of uh, check the LMS system um, that you are using, uh, just so that we kind of have a, an idea, and then obviously we can display this to the audience as well, so we've kind of got an idea of the, the sort of people that are on the call and the popularity of these, uh, these systems. So if you can fill that out, that would be great. Okay, just waiting for a couple more. Fantastic. I'm going to close the poll. So the majority of people that are on the call today are, uh, are using Blackboard, and we've got some using Moodle and Desire to Learn as well. We've got some people using Other as well, which is an interesting one. So existing publishing models, I'm going to run through kind of ways that people have of, of putting content onto their LMS system and kind of talk through the pros and cons of doing that. I mean, this might be something that you want to keep adopting, but um, I'm hoping that what we can show you later on in the presentation, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of value in, in doing um, things the way that we're going to display later on. So one model uh, that I see quite a lot is just that you know, we would have uh, um, users directly uploading media content into the learning management system. So they would go into Blackboard or Moodle, they would click on Add Media or something like that, a, a button of that ilk. And they would put a media file, it could be an AVI, an MPEG, something that's normally uncompressed onto the Blackboard or the Moodle system or the Desire to Learn system. The reason why this isn't a particularly good way of doing it is basically because um, the file that's going up there isn't optimized for streaming delivery. And you're also putting what is a very, very large file onto a learning management system. Learning management systems are effectively delivering stuff like a, a website would over HTTP. So they're not set up for media delivery. So this is a particularly inefficient and kind of non-scalable way of doing it. But in the vast majority of case, cases where people don't have their own streaming architecture set up, this is normally the way it happens. So it's, it's normally a case of the worst way of doing it is normally the, the kind of the default way of doing it because it's the path of least resistance, really, because it's the easiest way to do it. The other model is that people use YouTube because you know, it's a very obvious thing to use. It's very much in, in your face, and when you think about video on the web, you immediately think about YouTube. The pros to using that, it's obviously free to use. It's very simple to use. You can embed from YouTube very, very easily. There's multiple um, downsides to it, um, most of which are around copyright and kind of video quality and the fact that you can't really control access to the content. Copyright is, is particularly the one that I come across most because people are kind of saying, well, you know, I don't want to put my stuff on YouTube because I'm kind of giving it away. Particularly lecturers are, are very sensitive to that as well. Advertising is becoming more and more part of YouTube as well, and, and you might get um, an instance where there's unsuitable adverts that are appearing on, on YouTube as well. And then obviously securing your content. I mean, it's not impossible to do that with YouTube, but it's not something that you can control based on your organization. The next model is, is, is slightly uh, more is slightly more efficient way of doing it, but normally uh, is, is one that is used by people that are slightly more advanced and running their own streaming server. So this is an organization where they have their own streaming server. They might have their own um, streaming server that they've had over a number of years. Lecturers want to put content onto that streaming server. You might have a technician who you know is adept at converting content to be able to put it on a streaming server so it will be delivered uh, much more nicely than a kind of uncompressed media file that a lecturer might have. The problem with this process, though, is it's, it's incredibly manual and it's not scalable. It relies on a person doing it, and it's something that you're going to get a huge amount of bottlenecks with as well, and it just won't scale. The other thing as well is you know, your content could be produced in a variety of different formats by the technician, and there's a, m a multitude of different devices out there, and you want to cater for all of those. And really, you're, you're kind of handing that over to a technician who, who might, not be, uh, uh, might not have the expertise to do that. The other model that I see sometimes is that people say, well, actually, we, we're going to take a technician out of the equation here. We're going to give the ability for a lecturer to put some content directly on the streaming server, and they'll know a kind of a link format 
to that media file when they put it on the server. So this is slightly more scalable because it doesn't involve having a, a person in the way of the streaming server, but you're really at the behest of the lecturer here because the lecturer has got to transcode the content. They could do it in any format that they want, and then they're going to put it on the, the server via a network share and link to it. So it's, it's not the best way of doing it. It's certainly slightly better than the previous methods, but it doesn't normally, uh, it doesn't normally scale, and you're not going to hit all the different number of devices because a, a lecturer might uh, transcode or convert the content in a very idiosyncratic way that, that suits their workflow rather than suits the end user. I do see some people that kind of uh, automatically generate uh, some Im embed code from systems as well rather than giving links back to lecturers. These are, you know, these are much nicer systems. They're, they're a little bit more automated, but again, um, there's not really a user interface around this, so it, it doesn't really work from a usability point of view. The other thing to say as well at this point is that um, what you've got to be aware of is you've got to really create, you know, if you're going to put embed code back to the users, you're going to give them the ability to embed media players in, in web pages. You've got to make it so that the embed code works across the board. So a lot of people will say, well, you can put a file on the streaming server, and we're going to give you back some embed code, which will have your kind of link within it. But the thing to bear in mind here is that not all embed code will work across the board. So most people will create embed code that will work with Flash. If I was on a, a Windows PC, I could see that in Flash. But if I'm going to that on something like an iPad, I'm not going to have Flash, so it's not going to work. So it's not, it's not even ideal if you're giving people back this, uh, this embed code because you've, you've got to be aware of all these different devices and producing the content in a way that will work across all these systems. I'm going to go through how you can achieve this um, a little bit later on in the presentation, but I wanted to highlight it as an issue uh, early on in this presentation. So moving on from this, um, you know, you might be familiar with one of those ways of handling media already. You might have something that's different from that. But the one thing to be aware of is you need to create a system that's highly scalable and, and something that will work from a usability point of view, both for people putting content on the server and viewing the content back. So that here are some considerations um, that I see the majority of our customers go through um, when they're thinking about deploying uh, one of these kind of scalable um, video systems that, that does all of these things that I've been describing. So the first thing is, is the money. You know, how much are you going to spend? Is it going to be something that encompasses that your complete video strategy from end to end? Will it include lecture capture? Will it include um, kind of integration with your virtual learning environment? And is there a kind of low cost per pupil or, or employee of doing this? The next thing to check is the endpoints for the content. You know, you want to make sure that the content is accessible as possible across different devices. So you've got to define the formats that you're going to be encoding into or converting into, and the bit rates, the quality that you're going to do it at. So the bit rate, you know, you you need to define the quality in terms of you know the different countries that people might be viewing this content in, and then there's the issue of accessibility in terms of. Um, you know, 508 compliance, for example, you need to have captions on the video. The other thing is reach of the system. Is it just something that's going to be on, co on campus, or are you going to let people access it from home? How are you going to deal with the security around that? And also distance learning. Are you going to have people in, in countries that might not have fantastic um, bandwidth, so you're going to have to be able to convert the content at a low quality so that they can view it on devices that, that won't be able to play things back at high bit rates? Also, from the point of view of um, making the system work, ongoing, you've got to make it highly usable and very, very easy to use, easy to create content and easy to share the content as well. The other thing that I found in particular with these systems is when they're launched internally within something like a university, you've got to make a big splash. You've got to have some existing resources available in the library from day one. There's no point in launching a library that's got nothing in it. So one thing that we found, find in the UK in particular, and this obviously um, goes at, at across to the US and other markets as well, is kind of making some, some popular content available in it. So in the UK, you know, 
people are permitted to make uh, TV recordings available in their library from things like the BBC. But you might have some existing resources that have been popular through your existing streaming server or maybe things that you put on YouTube before. So it's a good idea to put that stuff on there from day one. The other thing is uh, what content you're going to secure, what, what actually has to be secured. So you don't want to be too overprotective of your content. You want to make as much available as you can. But there might be um, requirements from a, a legal uh, point of view that you have to protect in certain ways. So you've got to kind of segment your content in that way. Another thing um, that's worth considering, and this is once the system has been launched more than um, uh, from launch, is you, um, making the system used ongoing by having kind of trainer-trainer workshops and ongoing training and visibility of the system through emailers to the people that are using it, for example, and having training sessions that people can go to, or forums, for example. Also, from the point of view of the network manager, he wants to be um, confident that you can scale up with the demand for video. So kind of doing some scaling equations around, you know, if this many people use the, uh, the media library, then what would we do? And the other thing that's a kind of less obvious thing is if you've got lots of tablets and um, smartphones using the system internally, then your wireless network's got to be able to, to cope with that as well. So one choice you might have here is just to develop your, your own media library. You know, go down the route of kind of putting this media library together, use some streaming server components and some encoders and that sort of stuff, and, and create your, your own system. It's not the way that we would recommend of doing it, but that, that's one, one particular system that you've got, one particular option that you've got, rather. So at this point, I'm going to pause again for a poll. This one is really around what you have currently in terms of your streaming capability. So I think that you can actually check more than one option on this particular poll. So if you can just check and just say, you know, this is the particular um, system that, that we have at the moment, it would just be interesting, again, for the purposes of the webinar to, to kind of see what, what sort of stuff people have. And again, you know, you can check more than one. It's not, not a problem. Okay, so just wait for a couple more responses. Fantastic. So just going to uh, show that to the audience. So here we go. So most of the people on the, the webinar today have their own streaming server, but a lot of people have YouTube. I mean, these percentages obviously don't add, add up to 100% because you know, we've given the option to, to, to have more than one particular option. But you can see here that there's a mixture. Most people have a, their own streaming server. There are, are people using uh, YouTube, Vimeo, or equivalent systems. So it's a, kind of, it's a kind of mixed bag at the moment. And that's, that's really what I would, would have expected, actually. So OK, so we've gone through uh, the ways in which you, you could currently put content into your LMS system and gone through the disadvantages of do, doing that. We've gone through the things that you would consider when you're looking to develop your own uh, media library, video system, etc. What I'm going to go through now is kind of how you make it super, super easy for people to publish media to a, a media library system. I'm going to show you an example of a system that does that, which is the, the Helix Media Library. So what we found is um, in kind of developing a product that, that fulfills this need is, is simplicity. You've got to make things simple. If you don't th make things simple, people don't use them. So here's just a slide that kind of shows you, you capture something on your flip camera, and you want to make that available in a kind of easy-to-use interface. And that's the way this system works. So the principle here is, is that you can pretty much upload anything you want, audio or video, any format that you want, and then deliver it out to anyone, any device that you want as well. So again, a simple concept. A lecturer comes to you or, or an employee comes to you with a particular piece of media content. They want to make it available on the media library. The media library, the Helix Media Library in this case, does all of the work for you. It's converting it into a format that will work across all these different devices, and it's not caring what you upload to the system. So the process, I mean, it's a kind of process diagram here. It just says, you know, a user will upload the media content. Some, the media content will be archived off. Um, it will be converted into a format that will work across all these different devices. And the media library itself will return them with what, whatever you want them to, um, to, to be returned with. It could be embed code, or it could be uh, um, a link to the video, or even a link to download it. 
So this is what it looks like in practice. Um, what we've got here is uh, the, the, the media library with all the different options. All of the content is, uh, is categorized um, so that you've got kind of genres of content. You can, um, you can search through the media library for particular search terms, etc. And then this is the kind of the, the, the view that you would get in terms of the, the embedded media player and the option to kind of grab the embed code and, and put that elsewhere in another system like a virtual learning environment, Moodle, Blackboard, etc. So you've kind of got what is best described as kind of having your own YouTube that people can view and upload content to. The way it works in terms of security is um, users uh, of the media library system are uh, always members of, of groups. And groups have access to either view uh, content or view and upload to particular content categories. So in this case, we've got a user that's logged onto the media library. They're in a, a group called employees. And then the, the employees group has the ability to view certain categories when they log in and to be able to view and upload to certain categories. So this in the context of a university, this could be a user that's a member of a particular faculty within the university, and they'll have rights around what they can see and what they can upload to within the media library. Just a quick one to say here, I mean, this media library has the kind of default branding here. This, this can be branded as you know, whatever you want it to be in terms of your organization, and we'll show some examples of how that looks a little bit later on. So in terms of a user uploading to this, to this system, so this is, this system is something that you would really run internally on a, on a server. It's, a, it's kind of putting a front end on, on your, your existing um, kind of streaming setup. You would click on Upload. Once you've clicked on Upload, you then fill out your metadata for your content, your title, description. You decide on a category that you want to put the content into. You upload uh, your file, whether that's audio or video. It doesn't really matter. This differs from YouTube in that you can upload an audio or a video file. You don't have to create a, a video file with an audio track in the same way that you, you do with, with YouTube. So this will take a straight MP3 file or a straight WAV file if you throw it at it. It then extracts some thumbnails from the video. You, you choose the one that, that suits your content the best. You can then upload an associated file. So this could be a closed captions file, for example. It could be a PDF or a PowerPoint that would appear below the video. And then that's it. The, the media has gone up onto the media library, and it's going to be converted into this um, H.264 format, this format that plays across all of these different devices. And we've kind of done all that hard work for you in creating this content um, that will play across iPhone, iPad, Android, etc. Once the content's gone up there, it's gone up to this media library server that you're, you're hosting in, internally on your, uh, on your network. Uh, and it, it goes up to this watch folder, and it's converted. And then the user that uploaded the content will be returned with an email to tell them, yep, you know, it's been converted. If you want to view the content, go to this link. Or if you want to embed the content in another system, you can grab this embed code and put it into Blackboard or Moodle. And you can completely customize the email text that goes back to the, to the end user. So the vast majority of people that use this system will, will basically do that. They will grab the embed code from the media library system, and then they will put that into another system like SharePoint, Moodle, or Blackboard. We have specific uh, integrations with Moodle and Blackboard that I'll go through a little bit later. So we have a Blackboard building block, and we have a Moodle uh, plugin as well that allow you to search and embed uh, content from the media library within those two applications. But a lot of people will use this system just to embed content uh, from the media library that they're either returned by email, or they might go through the user interface and, and grab the embed code. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause just briefly for um, another poll. And this, this poll is around the devices that you see as most important to support in your environment. So I'm going to go through some uh, content on mobile devices and tablets and that sort of stuff um, in the next few slides. So it's just a, you know, of interest to see which ones you see as most important to support. Because this really shifts quite a lot, actually, from uh, from kind of webinar to webinar, the things that I do, you, you kind of see um, different things becoming important as more devices sell, etc. 
So I'm just going to wait for a few more responses on that one. So the choices are Android, Windows Phone, BlackBerry, or iPad, uh, iPhone and iPad. Great. Thanks for that. I'm going to close the poll now, show you guys the results. So here we go. We've got pretty much what I expected. <laughs> iOS devices and Android are the most uh, popular ones. And you've got a little bit of a, a camp there for the, the Windows Phone and no one for BlackBerry. Poor old uh, uh, BlackBerry. So in terms of making this content uh, accessible, I think that kind of falls into to two bits really. The, the first bit is, is making the content accessible in terms of devices. So the, the media library system that I've shown you, this system for uploading and, and getting the embed code back for the content, will work uh, across all these different devices, you know, the iOS devices, Android, um, BlackBerry, etc. And the way it works is if you go to the media library portal that I showed earlier, um, the, the media library will recognize the, the device that, that you're on, and it will render uh, a version of the portal for that particular device. So you can see here on the iPhone uh, that the, the site looks like a slightly cut down version, and then on the iPad it's, it's rendering a slightly different version of the site as well. So when you go to the site, the portal site, to uh, view the video on those particular devices, it will render uh, a website applicable to those devices. It's clever enough to do that. Similarly, the same is true of, of BlackBerry, not that anyone uses that or wants to use that on this particular webinar, um, but Android as well. You know, it will recognize you're on an Android device and it will render the site and it will make the streaming content work on those particular devices. So on this subject, we get a, a lot of people asking us uh, around this new technology or relatively new technology compared to Flash anyway. Uh, called HTML5, and what people are saying is, um, do I kind of want to uh, to go down the route of just supporting Flash, or, or do I want to support this thing called HTML5? So, so to explain here, you know, Flash has been the kind of the dominant player in this space for, for for a while now, and this thing called HTML5 has come along, which doesn't really need any uh, plugin in the browser or or anything to be installed as Flash does. There are issues with uh, HTML5 as well in terms of browser support. So both of these particular technologies have different strengths and different weaknesses. But what we've done with the media library technology is we've kind of said we'll, we'll support both and we'll kind of act as a, a failover if you don't have one particular technology over the other. The way this works to explain is, and this is to follow up on the point that I was making about embed code a little bit earlier, is that when you embed content from the media library, you grab the embed code and you put that embed code in another system like Blackboard or Moodle or, or, or whatever, you would get this little embedded media player that would appear in your web page or in your LMS system. Um, if you had Flash installed, then the embed code is, is clever enough to say, okay, you've got Flash installed. I'm going to play the media in Flash. If you went to that web page, it could even be within Blackboard or Moodle, and you didn't have Flash installed, you were on an iPad or an iPhone or something that didn't have Flash installed, then the embed code, the little embedded media player, will fail over to deliver the content using this HTML5 technology rather than using Flash technology. So what we've done is we've kind of safeguarded you. So if you embed the content and then you know, a few years down the line everybody's using HTML5 or everyone's using iPads or iPhones or whatever, you can support both of those, and you can support both of those ongoing. So you don't need to sit in one camp or the other. We've, we've done the work for you to create the, the code that works across all those different devices. The other point on accessibility is making uh, captions available as well, closed captions for, for, for media. Although I've not got a slide in this particular presentation on that, you can add uh, closed captions to media within the media library as well. The other point here is customizing your media library, making it uh, look um, as if it's something that fits into your current kind of uh, web real estate, so to speak. So the media library, you can completely customize the look and feel of the library. You can add your own header, footer image. You can make the, the color scheme as you want it. 
This even filters down to the mobile websites um, for the media library. You can even define down to the, the, the little shortcut icon that would appear on your, your iPhone when you bookmark the, the media library site. You can also completely customize uh, the, the email text that goes back to the, the users on failure or success of their um, clip being converted. And you can customize a multitude of different options, either on a, a global basis for the media library, like disabling video download across the whole library, or on a per category basis. So you might want to say, for this particular category, I'm going to disable the embed code feature for the portal so that people can't grab the embed code. That's one of the things that people sometimes like to do. You can also uh, completely define help text and disclaimer text for the library. So just to go through a few uh, examples, just to put some, some meat on the bones of, of this uh, particular product that I've shown, the Helix Media Library, uh, we've got tons of people using this globally, but these are examples that you know, are close to my heart, so they're ones that I know from, from the UK. We have the University of Manchester, um, which is one of the, uh, I think one of the top five universities in the UK by student numbers, a huge, huge university. They've got, um, I think now actually an update to this, they've got nearly 10,000 media assets in their library and over 350 different people con contributing to the library, which is kind of testament to its success. We've got another university called University of Central Lancashire that use their media library to automatically publish content to iTunes U. That's another thing that you can do with the media library. Uh, another university is in the east of England, which is kind of heavily used by the faculties university-wide. Called it's called the University of East Anglia. Another one uh, in the same part of the country. Um, again, this is used by uh, thousands of people. Uh, um, sorry, hundreds of people within this particular university, and it's used also um, for kind of external um, marketing purposes by, by a publicity department. Here's another one. This is actually a college, a further education college that are embedding lots of video in, into uh, YouTube. They're actually, uh, sorry, into uh, embedding lots of videos into Blackboard. And they're actually using uh, the media library. We have an integration with a, a lecture capture software called Camtasia Relay. And they're actually using their media library uh, to publish their lecture capture recordings into. This one as well, Exeter College is a similar one, using it for similar things. We have another one, another further education college called Hybrid College, who again, they're actually uh, embedding the content within Moodle and using a, a lot of their content to deliver back to iOS devices. And also they're streaming out to people uh, in Africa as well. So they're using kind of low, uh, low bit rate quality content to, to stream out to those people. We have countless examples of people using this software. This is just a kind of a, a flavor of the, the people that are out there today. If you need uh, specific kind of US examples. Um, all of our contact details will be at the end of the webinar. Drop us a line. We can put you in touch with people. So the next section is um, securing your content. Um, obviously, this is important from the point of view of um, uh, making this distinctive from something like YouTube because you, know, you want to have control over the content. You want to decide who has access to the content and who doesn't. So as I said before, um, you can set up groups within the media library and then give those groups access to categories and decide for each category what do you want that group to do. Do you want them to be able to upload to that category or do you just want them to be able to view that category? So in the context of uh, a university or a large business, what they would normally do is that they'll, they'll have an existing authentication structure. They'll use something like Active Directory, or they might use LDAP, for example. And that's how they'll have um, segmented the users within their organization, and that's how they'll give permissions to existing applications or even to log on to machines is, is another thing that people use Active Directory or LDAP for. So in the vast majority of cases, people already have all of these users in groups. They kind of have segmented them into organizational units. That's one way of doing it. Or security groups is a kind of a Windows-based way of doing it. What you can do with the, the Helix Media Library uh, is you can pair those uh, groups of users in your Active Directory or your LDAP to groups within uh, the Media Library. So you just have to 
do a, an initial kind of um, integration between the two. It's very quick and easy to do. And once that's been done, all that you do ongoing is you're creating uh, groups that have exactly the same name as the groups within your Active Directory. So when people log in to the media library, um, it's checking the Active Directory or the LDAP to, to, to see if they exist in the AD or the LDAP, and then it's determining their group membership in AD or LDAP, and then it's giving them rights to that group based on the permissions in the media library. So it's kind of it's as simple as we can make it, really. We're pairing groups in the media library to groups within these systems, and then we're giving access based on what options have been checked here in the administrator user interface of the media library. Another thing that you can do as well in terms of security is you can actually secure content down to an IP address range. So if you only wanted content to be available uh, on campus, let's say, or within a specific lab or something like that, you could nail it down to, to that, to a specific IP address range. And you can do that on a per category basis. That doesn't have to be for the entire library. It could be per genre of, of things that you're putting up there. Also to be available on the, uh, also to be aware of on the security side is the fact that when you embed this content elsewhere, you can make it so that the content won't play back. So you can make it so that they would have to be logged in to be able to see this content. So a lot of people are afraid of, well, you know, if somebody grabs my embed co code and they put it on a blog somewhere, will it play back? You can make the media library only play back content when, when somebody's logged in to, these particular, uh, to this particular system. So from um, a learning management point of view, the thing to say here about the media library is we, we have uh, an API. So if uh, you did want to develop an integration for the, the, the Helix media library, we have an API which is kind of public and documented. So it is something that can be developed on top of. What we've done um, is we've developed integrations already for Blackboard and, and Moodle. Those are the two that we've developed already with the API so that you, you can very easily embed media within courses within Blackboard and Moodle. So briefly, how they work, uh, the Moodle one, we effectively provide you with the ability to search the Helix Media Library repository uh, from within Moodle. So it has a, a very similar thing for YouTube and Flickr where you have a kind of a file picker. So you can pick a file from within your media library. You can search for, for a file within the, the Moodle file picker and then kind of one click embed it into a particular course that you're, you're running in Moodle. So rather than taking the embed code out of the media library, you can just find it and then click to embed it. Blackboard is very, very similar. We, we have a, a mashup for, uh, for Helix Media Library within Blackboard, and it works in an in incredibly similar way to the existing YouTube mashup. So the YouTube mashup within Blackboard, you search for a video or find all the videos under that search term within YouTube, and then you just click to either preview the video or click to embed the video in a course. And we have the same thing for the Helix Media Library. What we're doing in, in future versions of this, so a version that, that should be out um, kind of Q1 timeframe for next year, is we're, we're going to be using a, a technology called LTI to help us make these um, Moodle and Blackboard integrations much more um, powerful and kind of uh, deeper in terms of the integration with both of those systems. So we're using uh, a bit of technology that's going to allow us to pass permissions from uh, Blackboard and Moodle to the media library and, and, and make the, the integrations uh, a lot more kind of joined up than, than what they are today. But currently, we have a, a mashup and a, and a file picker. If you need any more information on those particular things, then feel free to, to get in contact with us, and we can certainly demo those things to you as well. So as a quick summary to what the media library does, I mean, to kind of assist you in, in you know, having these kind of simple steps to use media within your organization, it's, it, it's basically providing you with this kind of, kind of managed and secure sort of corporate uh, YouTube, and it's cutting down on the overhead that you would have. I guess the most important thing that I see about it is that we're taking the work out of it for you. We're producing a video that will work across all of those different devices, and you, and you and your users, whether they're lecturers, employees, or students, or whoever, aren't having to think 
that you have to create the content in a particular way. We've done all of that homework for you. You just throw a file at this media library system and it will create some embed code or create a link or whatever that will work on all those different devices. And it makes it very, very simple. It's a very simple upload process. So moving on from that, if you do want to be contacted in the next 30 days, we, we can reach out to you. Um, the way this sometimes works is that um, this is obviously a, a software application that you can install on a server on your network. Um, so we can run a pilot programs. So if you made a, a, a Windows server uh, 2008 available to us, we can actually remote on and install a pilot version of the, the software for you. Um, and, and, and do that for you for a period of, of 30 days, actually. So if you do want to be contacted, let us know. So it only remains for me to say thanks very much for, for everyone uh, for coming. If there's any questions now, we'll run a kind of short Q&A session, punch them through the chat. I'm more than happy to, to answer the questions that people have got. I've got a few kind of frequently asked questions here that I'm going to kind of um, uh, go through anyway. But if you've got any specific questions on the, the Helix Media Library or anything that I've gone through today, just feel free to put it in the chat and we can go through that. If you need any further information on the Helix Media Library as a product, then there's two websites you can go to, uh, helixmedialibrary.net. Uh, or if you want to start an evaluation, this kind of 30-day pilot that I alluded to, you can go to this uh, longer address here, but you can copy that down. And you can normally get to that via the realnetworks.com slash helix website quite, quite usefully. So we've got one question that came in here. Um, are our usage statistics available? Uh, yes, they are. So within the media library itself, uh, I'm actually going to go into desktop sharing mode here just to kind of show you this. So we have some high-level uh, kind of statistics here that are in the administrator dashboard. Um, and this is kind of things about the library, number of logins, that sort of stuff. Um, also um, available is um, within the um, the actual streaming server that's powering this media library is called the, the Helix server. That's a, the Real Network streaming server. That has a, a log file, um, and within it, it will show you pretty much everything that's gone on uh, from the server. So the log file can be parsed into a, a, a log analyzer. There's a log analyzer called sawmill.net, uh, so www.sawmill.net. Net, I think it is um, that you can parse that log analyzer into. So yeah, you can you can get pretty much you can get very very granular uh, with the the statistics. Got another question here, which is talking about uh, any future developments regarding desire to learn integration. So um, at the moment, this is this is up for debate um, from what I gather. So the route that we're going down with the Blackboard and the Moodle integrations is to use LTI technology to do that, which is this kind of bridging technology between LMS applications and other applications like the Helix Media Library, where you can um, pa pass uh, credentials or a user context from uh, an LMS system to another application. Desire to Learn is a, an LMS system that you can use LTI with. We're developing specific LTI integrations for Blue, Moodle and Blackboard, but that's not to say that we can't develop a, a generalized uh, LTI integration that would work across more applications. So at the moment, what I would say on that is there aren't any plans to do it in the, the near term in terms of Q1 of next year, but um, it's not something that... Um, that is beyond the realms of possibility for later on in the year. And Desire to Learn would be one of the ones that would be covered by doing a kind of more general LTI integration. So I don't think we have any more questions through the chat. So I've got a, a few, if you need to ask a question, feel free to do so. I've got some more kind of frequently asked questions that I get asked a lot, whether the media library does um, HD encoding, high def encoding. It does. So if you throw a HD file at the media library, it will um, encode the file at HD resolution. You can turn that on or off if you want to. It's, it's kind of up to you if you don't want to do HD encoding. Um, 
We also get asked quite a lot about lecture capture integration. So do, do we support any integration with any particular lecture cap capture systems? The one that we support at the moment is a system called Camtasia Relay. Um, Camtasia Relay, again, I'll kind of show it on my, on my desktop here. It allows you to very, very easily uh, publish the recording of your desktop and, and your, your webcam, for example, um, and publish that to the media library. So here's Camtasia Relay. I can select the display that I want to record. So I'm going to select my uh, primary monitor here. I could have my, my webcam showing if I wanted to, and that would appear as a little camera down the bottom here. I can type in my title and my description for my, for my um, broadcast that I'm doing. This, this is kind of a very simple approach to lecture capture, obviously. I click on record. It counts me down. Um, I record my, my lecture, whatever I was doing. You know, this would be using my uh, webcam and my mic of my, my laptop. Click stop. And then I can uh, top and tail the video. I can you know, trim a bit off the start and at the end. And then at the end of it, I just click Submit. Um, and then that would submit it directly to my, my media library system. And all of those recordings can be made uh, available within the media library. So here's just a, just show you a quick example of how that works. Uh, this media library here. We've got some recordings here. These are ones that were recorded with uh, Camtasia Relay. There's a hell of a lot of test uh, recordings here, but you'll, you'll see here is a demonstration of Camtasia Relay. It was recorded, and it's been output directly to, to the media library with no kind of user intervention at all. The other one I get asked quite a lot is um, the, uh, the Moodle and the Blackboard integrations, how they work. I mean. If, if you want to see the specifics of those, certainly get in touch and we can kind of run through how that would work with your, your environment. But at the moment what we have is a, a repository search as, as I showed. And what we're going to do is make it so that um, a lot more of the, the media library functionality that I showed, the kind of the upload and the, the content management side is something that's all within Blackboard rather than having to go to another application. Great. Okay, so if there's any more questions, put them through the chat. Um, if there's not, then what I'll say is um, thank you for coming. Um, and if you want to get in touch, use either of those routes. You can fill out the form at helixmedialibrary.net, or you, if you want to start an evaluation, go through the realnetworks.com website. Um, thank you very much for coming. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in the product.